Praise the Lord. Hello, Stonebridge Church. It's again, terrific to be God's house with God's people. And um, so much that could be said about what's taking place in, in this house right now. Just the powerful presence of the Lord here. Um, just so grateful. I'm so grateful. Um, I'm going to just jump right in um, to continue in our series of uh, absolute certainty. And uh, I'm really doubling down this week, I'm going to complete the second chapter of Colossians as we were looking at uh, the absolute certainty of having the full assurance of our faith. So for several weeks now, I've mentioned how probably one of the most obvious statements a human being could make, uh, living in very uncertain times. And, uh, but our goal uh, is really to be able to live and, 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 and thrive from a position, a place in our lives where we can have absolute certainty. And again, absolute meaning literally independent of any other cause. As in, he is an absolute God. And if you hear me say nothing else, the main central idea this morning is he is enough. You don't need God plus something else. He's enough. He, 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 is, he is our all in all. He's complete in himself. Uh, he's, he's unconditional. And to have certainty is simply a, a fixed or real state, it's truth, it's fact, it's a full assurance of mind, and it's exempt from all doubt and failure. This is why we can confidently, with absolute certainty, say that we have absolute assurance in who God is. Perhaps your absolute certainty isn't that rock solid, and uh, I wish mine were I wish I had absolutely cert, uh, I was absolutely certain about the full assurance of my faith every moment of every day, but I am also a human being living in a fallen world. But I can say that I've got more absolute certainty by my full assurance of faith that I, today than I did yesterday. I can say that with absolute certainty and confidence because of the one in whom I'm following and because his promises and his word that he has said, if, if you, I will lead if you will follow. We follow him in, 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 in being transformed into his likeness and his, in, in his image. And so maybe you're on this spectrum of sometimes you're, you're, you're sure and you're confident, but then other times maybe you're, you're not so sure and you, you, you have some doubts. And this is why the word of God is so important as we allow the Holy Spirit to illuminate what he, he has already inspired and, and, and given to us because it's the foundation of how we determine whether we have absolute certainty or not. And so uh, I started out uh, three weeks ago about talking about having absolute certainty about what we've been taught. All of us are at some point in our journey of life. And so be absolutely certain about what you have been taught, especially regarding this one named Jesus Christ. Then we talked about having absolute certainty about trusting in him and him alone. And, uh, and then last week and this week, we're going into having that full assurance of the faith that we can have in him, as I said, I'm, I'm doubling down as Paul brings out here in the second chapter of Colossians this, this, uh, uh, these warnings about false doctrines that had already uh, been creeping into the, the, the early church in the first century. Fast forward to 2023, can you imagine, especially with all of the, uh, the technology and information superhighway, imagine the false doctrines trying to creep into the church today. I'm so grateful he was already aware of this back then. So the truth of the matter is nobody's going to get away with coming up with their own version of Jesus. I'm talking to the church. If there's any sinners apart from Christ, I, I am speaking to you. More importantly, I think the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. He's, he's lovingly convicting you. He's, he's revealing himself to you. And apart from our repentance and putting our faith and trust in him, we're separated from God. And there's, there's always going to be a, a, a wanting, a lacking, a search for this mystery that we spoke of last week. I, 
I'm going to kind of fast forward this message. I was going to do a little bit of a review, but I encourage you to just go back and, and, and listen to part one of, of this message, if you will, that has much to do about these false doctrines, these man-made ideologies, uh, these philosophies, and these uh, religious regulations that human beings over the years have wanted to add to what God has already done for us. Um, if your Jesus is not the Jesus of the Bible, uh, he's a false God. Not even real. And anything that's not real is not going to be to do anything for you. If your Jesus is not the Jesus described in the Holy Bible, he's a false God. He's a fantasy, he doesn't exist, and you're going to live life very, very empty. No ability, no power to do a thing for you. And, and, and I'm, I, I, I want to give this illustration, and in no way, shape, or form, let me, let me preface this illustration with this, in no way, shape, or form am I trying to compare God and the value of any amount of money, all right? You with me on that? You've got the context of this illustration, so you don't come, a, come away confused, but when you're talking about false doctrines, false teachers, man-made ideologies, religious regulations, it, I, I thought of this simple comparison. Let, let's say that, that um, uh, I'm going to give you a one-time limited chance to go to a specific address and pick up a million dollars in cash. Would anybody be interested in that? All right, a few. The rest of you, we appreciate your tithes and offerings in the house of God. And, and so with that, I'm going to give you two options. One is a, uh, verbal instructions. I'm going to give you verbal instructions of how to get to this address so you can have a thousand. No, no strings attached. Million dollars cash, yours. Taxes are already paid on it. Yours to do what, what, <laughs> yours to do what you will with it. So here's option one. Um, uh, I can give you directions to it. And if you don't trust me, maybe a family member, a trusted friend, they, they can give you directions to it. it can, it's, it's, not, it's not a flat, straight path. There's, there's some hills and some valleys and some turns and, and, and some things to, to go over. But, uh, and and now, now, if you take this option, there's some risks. Right? You've got this human element. Uh, uh, even though I've been there many times, I may forget a turn here or a turn there. Uh, you might not fully comprehend what, what I'm saying. So now we got twice the improbability of you actually getting there. The other option is this. I can give you a fully programmed, fully charged GPS navigation system run by probably a billion-dollar satellite put in a space somewhere, backed up by three other billion-dollar satellites that, that pinpoint your start and uh, your, your, your path and your end, and it'll track your progress in real time. That's the other option. The only risk is you reading it incorrectly. That's the only risk. This is, this is, this is the difference between these false doctrines, these man-made ideologies, these religious regulations that, that we conjure up and come up with to, to, to help God out, get us to where he is calling us to. False doctrines. Speaking to the church and with the church in mind, uh, somebody had sent me this quote. It's by um, Charles Spurgeon, 19th century uh, English preacher, prince of preachers as he was known. By the way, uh, fun fact, not, not very fun for him, he only lived to be 57 years old. Um, uh, Hence, not the fun part, uh, but, but the, the impact that he, he made, uh, you would have thought that he was much older. But here's a quote from Charles Spurgeon. He said, discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It's knowing the difference between right and almost right. This is why we need the Holy Spirit of God illuminating the Word of God. We, we need the GPS navigation system for life. And God has given it. It's fully available. It's fully charged. You will always have connection. You will, it, it, it is tracking your life in real time. It'll get you. And the great, best thing about it is there's going to be no question that he'll announce that you've arrived at your destination when you get there. Praise God. Praise God. 
So uh, uh, I had jumped into the end of chapter one where we were talking about the mystery, that hidden purpose and secret will that, that uh, had gone on for generations, that being Jesus Christ and, and the rich, riches of the glory of this mystery, the, the, the wealth and the abundance of, of, of knowing and understanding and having the wisdom of this great mystery that is none other than, than Jesus, Jesus Christ. So there's no question to be absolutely certain that we can have this full assurance of faith. But to do so, we must remain Christ-centered, focusing on and prioritizing the significance of him, his life, his death, burial, and resurrection. And so Paul began this second chapter with not just teachings, but warnings. Warnings. You think of all the prophets uh, that came through the Old Testament and all that they spoke of. Uh, one thing that they weren't shouting from the, the mountaintops or the prisons or, or, or the wilderness was, hey, I've got seven steps for you to live a better life now. That, that's not what they were saying. They were full of warnings about what to look for, about how to navigate through this journey of life, and the one to keep fixed on. And so uh, if we're going to have this full assurance of our faith in Jesus Christ, must must have supremacy in every aspect of our life. Some of these warnings we read were uh, verses 4 and verses 8, verses 9. He said, now this, this I say to you, lest anyone uh, de should deceive you with persuasive words. Beware lest anyone cheat you, which is uh, uh, really it, the, the Greek meaning there is to take you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not, here's the key, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So now, as I mentioned, Paul doesn't specifically name what these false teachings are, but as they are uh, revealed, it was likely a mixture of Jewish, Greek, Oriental uh, religions, uh, that became these philosophies uh, known as the early Gnostics or um, the parts of Judaism, um, these rules and, and regulations and dictates that some of the Jews were putting, uh, having to put in place, you know, to help God out because maybe he needed a little help. Maybe he doesn't have everything understood. Maybe the pathway to him and, and ultimately to heaven isn't that clear. Gnostic in the Greek means to know or secret knowledge, even superior knowledge. And so these Gnostics were simply these self-imposed and elite group of people who sought in, uh, really knowledge as the, as the end, end of it all. It was all about gaining this, 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 this knowledge if you were of that type of group, if you qualified, if you were mystical enough. And then, of course, Judaism is, is those of the, the religion of, of, of Judaism and, and how they were influencing others to, uh, for, for demanding the need to observe these dietary restrictions and the, and the feast days and the festivals and these regulations and, and, and these do's and don'ts. And they were infiltrating this, this newly established Gentile church in Colossae. And this letter, of course, also affected the church in Laodicea just uh, 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 10 or 11 miles, miles away. And so today's text, let's go to the second chapter of Colossians, and let's pick this up. As I said, I'm doubling down on, on, on uh, this, uh, this desire, this, this, this conflict, Paul called it, a struggle. A, a, he was in despair about them knowing and understanding the, 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 the fullness of, of, of what, who this mystery was, of course, in, in Jesus Christ. Uh, so let me get in the right letter here. Colossians, the second chapter, I'm going to pick it up in verse 11. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. And it says, In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh... He has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Can I get an amen from somebody? 
I mean, I hope to God, and I mean this since I hope to God that you have not heard the message of the cross so many times that it doesn't have significance in your life. Because that's the case, God help you. And the Bible's got a name for you. It's called stiff-necked people. This is about remembering your first love. When you were a wretched sinner, separated from God, with an eternal hell for your destination. But now, now because of what Christ did to the cross, now because of the Holy Spirit working in your life, wiping away this handwriting that was on the wall, that was contrary to you, that was opposing you, that was, that was against you. He, he took it all away and offered you his mercy and his love and his grace. Abundant life here and now and eternal life forever. God help us if we never, if we don't get excited about the message of the cross. Praise God. Verse 15, having disarmed principalities and power. It just gets better and better. Having disarmed principalities and powers and the, and the uh, uncircumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together with him. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm reading it again because I, I'm going to read it again. I'm going I'm to back up and read thir uh, verse 13 again. And you being dead, and now he's talking about you having been dead. He's talking to those that are now alive in Christ, in relationship with Christ. But you, having been dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Let no one cheat you. Here's that word again. Cheat you. Take you captive uh, out of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. Speaking to our church rally cry again this year. The increase that only comes from God. In verse 20, therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you sub subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using According to the commandments and doctrines of men. Verse 23, these things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of our flesh. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. This firm foundation that we can stand on, that, that gives us the ability to have absolute certainty about our, the full assurance of our faith that we have in Christ Jesus. Lord, I pray that your word is not just heard. I pray that it penetrates the depths of our heart, a heart that has fertile soil. Lord, as we have been in your presence, as we praised you for the things that you've done, worshiped you for who you are, our hearts are ready to receive your life-changing word, Father, I pray you'd empower us by your Holy Spirit to then walk it out in this journey that you've called us on, bringing you glory, blessing people with the good news, and living the abundant life of riches that you promised us. God, we give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's a, 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 just amazing that in, in the middle of these, these warnings to this church about these primarily two false doctrines of philosophy and legalism. He, Paul takes the time, it's as if he can't help himself, and I really get it as a minister of the gospel, to, 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 talk, about, to talk about Jesus. This powerful description of who he is in verses 11 through 15 and, and the importance of us being able to have this absolute certainty of the full assurance of faith in him, of knowing exactly who the real Jesus is. I'm not, I, I kid you not, the number of Jesuses that are being preached out there, I've lost count. I've lost count. We're talking about the real Jesus Christ, the true and only living God. 
the only one that has the power to change lives, to eradicate sin, the power of sin, the power of death. There's only one real Jesus, and it's him that we must, pre we must preach and him crucified. Knowing exactly who he is and what he's done for us. What it, what it means, we hear these terms our whole life, what it means to be redeemed and born again and set free and saved and justified and, and, and having accepted him in our hearts and the blessings and the benefits of knowing Christ as both Lord and, and Savior. And then we get back to looking at this other false doctrine in, in, in verse 16 where others are trying to influence the people of the church, putting extra weights and burdens and tasks and restrictions on them to follow, follow Jesus. So in Jesus, in that verse 11, it's, it's, it's in relationship with him that we were all circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, putting off the body of, of the flesh by a circumcision, not by, not by man's hands, but by Christ himself. We're talking about spiritual matters, and it's because a physical circumcision was a symbol. It was a sign of Israel, Israel's covenant with God uh, back originally. Uh, when you, you, at eight days old, as a uh, male Jewish boy, you were to be circumcised, circumcised. This was part of the Mosaic law. But even in the Old Testament, under the demands of the law, God's, God's main concern wasn't this a uh, uh, physical matter to take place. Deuteronomy 10 and 16 says this, Therefore circumcise the foreskin representing sin of your heart and be stiff-necked or rebellious no longer. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 6, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. And so even in the practice of physical circumcision by the, uh, the Hebrew people, the intent of it was simply just a sign of what took place in the heart of a man, the circumcision of God himself. What circumcision does physically is what faith in Christ's finished work on the cross does for us spiritually. It's putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. It's, it's cutting away, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's cutting away the, that old man, the old, old sin nature that used to rule our lives. Putting off in the Greek, is, it translates uh, uh, meaning the stripping off and casting away. It's an imagery, if you will, of it's discarding it as if not having it a place in, in your life any longer. He goes on to say, and buried with him in baptism in verse 12, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Oh, that thing that separates Christianity from every, every other world, world religion and cult. These other world religions, you know what they demand? That you die for your God. What does our great faith demand? That we simply have faith in our God who died for us. What a loving God. People say, well, well God this and God that. I can't believe he'd do this and do that. What, what are you talking about? He died that you might live. To have the audacity and the pride to question a God who would do that is beyond my comprehension. Paul wrote about this in this uh, uh, epistle of the, uh, to the Romans, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 5. Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified, circumcision of the heart here, uh, that with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, meaning rendered inoperative, not ruling and reigning in our life anymore, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Praise God. This, this idea uh, 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 behind this Greek word of, of baptism here, it actually has several, several meanings. Ultimately, the idea behind the, the, the Greek word baptism is to immerse or overwhelm something. To immerse and overwhelm something. Listen to these examples. Uh, uh, the Bible brings this out clearly and, and, and talks about it in several different ways. 
When a person is baptized in water, they are immersed or covered over or overwhelmed with water. When they are baptized with the Holy Spirit, they are immersed or covered over, filled, it, filled up with the Holy Spirit. When they're baptized with suffering, as the scriptures bring out, they are immersed or covered over with suffering. And so here in, in this 12th verse, Paul is talking about a baptizing that, yes, does mean immersed and covered over, but it's in Christ Jesus as we identify by faith in what he did on the cross. We, we also are, he also recognizes us doing that same thing, dying to ourself. And then being raised to new life in him. Resurrected once again. And so there's definitely a spiritual baptism followed by a physical baptism. So some scholars are in disagreement here whether he's significant, uh, is particularly talking about water baptism or the baptism uh, into Christ's death as identifying with him by faith. E either one, that, that uh, it's a command of the Lord that we follow our uh, commitment to the Lord with water baptism, the outward sign of an, of an inward experience that we've had with, with, with the Holy Spirit of God. A powerful, powerful time. Uh, just as uh, I know people say, well, how, why do you clap your hands and raise your hands and, and, uh, and then, well, most of you Scandinavians move a little bit and I don't necessarily see you jumping up and down, but what, what, what's that all about? Listen, that's a physical response to what's going on inside of our hearts. We're praising God for, 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 for all that he's done. We're worshiping him for who he is. I mean, don't, 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 don't be coy with me. Don't play dumb with me. I see people doing the very same thing at bizarre, ungodly rock concerts and meaningless sporting events. So, so to say that it's weird that we're doing it as church, you know, you're weird. Yeah. <laughs> It's a physical sign of a spiritual response to, to what's going on in our hearts. And there's not a greater thing that could go on in all of the world than a heart or than, than, than a person that was once dead, spiritually dead in their sins and trespasses. And now they become anew and alive in Christ because of their repentance of their sins and putting their faith and trust in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There's not a greater experience. There's, we, should have, we should have even a greater response for what he's done for us. We cannot praise and worship him enough. Not enough words can be said of gratitude for who he is and what he's done for us. And so uh, some scholars had even suggest that as, as circumcision was a sign of the old covenant, water baptism is a sign of the new covenant. It's an outward expression of an inward experience. And this is what takes place because of our beloved Savior. And he goes on to say, And in you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh... He's made alive together, this is so key, with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So first and foremost, you're never, come al you're never gonna come alive completely and, and holy and walk in freedom without Christ. Always with him. And he always stays with us. Didn't he say he walks with us and he talks with us and he said, I'll never leave you and I'll, I'll never forsake you. All that we have in God, all that we have uh, to live for in this world and to look forward to is with Jesus. Not apart from him, not separated, unless we willfully choose to walk away. And, and so trespass here in the Greek is it's a deviation from truth and, and uprightness. It's a specific kind of sin. It's, it's overstepping a boundary. You know, we have... Uh, I don't see them down here as much. I, I grew up in a small town in northern Minnesota. You go for any drive down any country road, you look on the wood line, it's got no trespassing. Another big, no trespassing, no trespassing. And so it would be as if, okay, I, I, I'm good as long as I'm here, but if I cross over this property line, I am now trespassing. I've overstepped the bounds that, that, are, that, that I can legally, actively uh, be in. This is what trespassing is, it, it, what he's talking about. He's forgiven us of all of those times that we've overstepped the bounds that he's had for us. Those bounds that, that cross over into in, in, in anything that is unholy, unrighteous, unjust, and impure. He's forgiven us if we have a heart of repentance. Because we are spiritually dead when we overstep these boundaries in sin and rebellion. And there is simply no other way, simply no other way than to be made alive together than without Jesus. Didn't he say in John 14, 6, I am the way, 
I'm the truth, the life. No, no one comes to the Father except through me. You have to do this with Jesus. Paul goes on and, and writes how, 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 how Jesus did this. How did, he, how did he forgive our trespasses, our sins, our iniquities? He having wiped out the handwriting of requirements, which really was a certificate of death that was, it was against us and contrary to us. This is as, this is as if it was a handwritten uh, legal document by, by God himself. And we have the old covenant, and, and we, 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 Jesus fulfilled the old covenant, but God's moral laws still stand today. They still stand. And so we, he's, got, he's got his rules. He's got his, his requirements. And this handwritten legal document carried with it a severity of a determined judgment if you broke those rules and you broke those regulations. Another representation of it could be a, a legal document or recording of a debt that needed to be paid. So it could be one or either, both of these. But this was a legal binding document that uh, when you are spiritually separated from God, that the, the enemy has the legal right to rule and reign in your life. And he does. People say, I don't need your God to, 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 to uh, believe that I can't run and regulate my own life. Listen, you're either going to be a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. There are no other options. It is one or the other. You can live in denial all you want. You, you, can, you can live in, in self-imposed uh, religion and pride. But there's only one of two ways. You're either a slave of sin or a slave of righteousness. And Jesus removed those requirements that were against us and that opposed us. And he took them with him to the cross. That's what it means by they were nailed to the cross. The cross being a symbol of death. To be no more. To be the end. And Paul alluded to this, uh, as I mentioned last week, these, these, these uh, principalities and, and powers that have been disarmed. In verse 10 he had said, And you are complete or mature in Christ, who is the head of all principality and power. All rule and authority. Spiritually, naturally, whatever it is, Jesus Christ is the head. And then in the 15th verse, he said that I've disarmed these principalities and powers. Every rule and authority. And made a public spectacle of, of them, triumphing them over them in it. And so at this time, back in the first century in Colossae, we've got the two greatest powers of man. We've got the Roman government. We've got the religion of Judaism. Rather, this, this particular thing took place in, in Jerusalem on a hill called Golgotha at Calvary where the cross of Jesus Christ was stood up with him nailed to it. They, these, this Roman government and these uh, religious Jews joined forces to put Jesus on public display in, in, uh, in a public crucifixion. Satan and every demon in hell reveled in how they had won this great victory. But little did they know, they were the ones being defeated. They, they were the ones being disarmed. They were the mon ones being rendered powerless and ultimately facing an eternal lake of fire. Paul writes in, in the first uh, letter to the Corinth, uh, Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of our glory. Here it is, verse 8, which none of the rulers of this age knew. The Roman authorities didn't know about this. The Jewish people uh, uh, blinded in their, in their religion didn't know about this. For had they known, they would not even have crucified the Lord of glory. But through his work on the cross, he defeated every spiritual enemy known. High, low, far, wide, near. And this public display wasn't just carried out on a hill called Golgotha, this display of his uh, disarming principalities and powers, wickedness in high places and rulers in darkness, this was on display throughout the entire universe. This is, this is who this Jesus is. This is the real Jesus. This is the real true doctrine. And so many, many, uh, I think of this. To know that, that the enemy and, and every, every demon in hell and, 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 and has been stripped and disarmed of, of, their, of their armaments, of their weapons, 
uh, of their power and of their abilities. And yet many in the church, I have found, have this misconception uh, uh, that, that we as Christians have this great battle that we need to fight. Who are you fighting against? I'm fighting against the devil. Yeah. Well, he's already defeated. He is a roaring, toothless lion trying to give you idle threats. With lies and deceits and persuasive words and cheating you out of things with philosophies of man and, and, and religious tradition. What are you fighting that garbage for? Jesus gave us the ultimate victory. He defeated every principality, every power. He rendered Satan helpless. And the only way that he has any victory in your life is if you give it to him. That's it. So stop fighting this battle that Jesus has already won. Walk in overcoming victory by faith as we further come to know and understand with, with wisdom this great mystery called Christ and, and who he is. I, I, I get this. From an outside perspective, some of the stuff we talk about just seems like out there. I mean, you guys are talking about this God that I, I've never been able to see Somehow he left some throne in heaven and came to earth. Uh, some woman got pregnant without being pre without a without a, a man, and and you talk about this shedding blood all over the place. I mean, what is that stuff all about? Listen, I, I get it. It you know in our own understanding, it's going to sound like foolishness. The message of the cross is foolishness to them that are perishing. But to us that are being saved, it's the power of salvation. It's the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the more that you look at it and study it and understand it, God will give you wisdom and, and, and it'll mean more to you and it'll be clearer to you and you will be able to be absolutely certain that the full assurance of your faith is something that no one can ever take away from you. No demon in hell, no devil, no world philosophy, no religious institution. It is your full assurance of faith in Jesus Christ. And Christ, Christ, the one who's defeated Defeated, past tense, Satan. The one who, who, uh, whom, whom we've died with and been raised to new life with. The one that we trust, who's gifted us with this victory. So we don't have to be cheated. We don't have to be persuaded by, by these, these words and these worldly uh, man-made ideologies and worldly philosophies. We don't have to be led captive uh, to the lies and the deceits of, of the enemy anymore. Paul's emphasis of Jesus and his finished work on the cross could it could be summarized by stop attempting to add something that Jesus finished it's finished it is finished we are victors we are overcomers still going through hard times Still having to persevere through deep valleys. Still having to perhaps suffer in this fallen world. But I am telling you, we are victorious. Not because of anything that, that we've done or can do, but because of who Christ, who Christ is. The only way, let me just have, the only way that he can gain any... Any, he has no leverage. He has no foothold. He, he has no angles. The only thing that he can get any headway into your life is if you, you, you doubt what God has done for you while you are yet a sinner. If you doubt who you are in relationship to Christ Jesus. If you doubt his ability to sustain you through those valleys, through those circumstances, through those situations. If you doubt that, that his joy that gives you strength or his grace isn't enough for you. Too many. God-fearing, Bible-believing Christians wasting their time and energy on a fight that's already been won decisively, once, for all, emphatically. So, so Jesus, he is enough for us. There's nothing more that needs to be done to secure our right standing with him. He did it all. And Paul goes on to write, Therefore, verse 16, let, let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding festival or feast day or the new moons or Sabbath. Uh, those are the shadow of things to come. But the substance, it's Jesus. He, he is the substance. All of what was, was coming, it was about him. All those things of the law, they were just a shadow of who was to come. Shadow in the Greek means it's an image cast by an object representing the form of that object. 
And that's why we see Jesus throughout the entirety of the Old Testament, of the types and the shadows, all speaking of the substance of what was to come, the great mystery that was to be revealed, none other than Jesus Christ and him crucified. Christ was the object of reality that casted those shadows in the Old Testament. And he was the object of faith then, and he's our object of faith now. He fulfilled every demand of the law and became substance. So don't let these people say, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't eat this, you can't. Uh, Paul writes to Timothy in the first, uh, his first letter, chapter 4, about this. Verse 4 says, For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified or set apart by the word of God in prayer. If it is done with the right motivation, with the right heart. So they bless God, I'm not eating pork or shrimp or lobster because I am holier than anyone who does. <laughs> you want to do that for a, for a physical dietary benefit? God bless you. I mean, do, I'm, not, I'm not against people that are against eating pork or shellfish. But that's not, that doesn't have anything to do with you being, being more favored by this Jesus that already died for you, that already won the battle for you, that has given you freedom in relationship with him. Therefore, Paul goes on, verse 18, let no one cheat you out of this reward. Our reward is knowing this once hidden and now revealed mystery, who's Jesus. The Bible taught to have the, to have the riches, the treasures of all wisdom and knowledge, giving us a full assurance of who he is as our object of faith. And let me just put a little warning. Be, beware of super spiritual people. Super, anybody run into any of these super spiritual people? I mean, but Paul's kind of writing about these super spiritual people in here. They're, they're, they're vainly seeking the truth uh, beyond the word of God, the revealed word of God. They're like, well, this is what the Lord told me. Really? Where, 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 where can we find that in Scripture? <laughs> vainly believing these things that they don't see. You know why they don't see them? Because they're making them up. <laughs> That's why they don't see them. Looking to solve this great mystery, relying on, you know what, they're, they're relying on fleshly logic and human reasoning. And that, that'll get you in trouble about every time. <laughs> Trying to come to God in some other ter terms than what's explicitly found in the scriptures. So instead, he says, we need to hold fast to Jesus Christ because he is the head. Capital H there, he is the head of the body of Christ. Hold fast. Be, be fir firmly and tightly gripped it's to, to remain secure. You talk about uh, um, uh, the sailors and how they uh, firmly attach the, uh, the, the boat to the docks. It's, fir it's to, so that it is held fast, only recognizing uh, him for, for who he is. And, and it, it, it prescribes, uh, will provide what was described in, in, the, in the earlier verses of this chapter about our hearts. This is, what, this is Paul's this, was, this is what Paul wanted for his people for our, and your, your hearts as we read it today in 2023 to, to have our hearts encouraged that we might be knit together in love attaining to these riches and the full assurance of the understanding of the knowledge of the great mystery of God. As the worship team comes, I want to bring this to this place, giving us another opportunity to just respond to the Lord and his presence that's here. And his word that is for us. You know, this, 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 is, this entire book is for us. He goes on in verse 20, says, Therefore you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world. So why? Why do you subject yourselves to these regulations? Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do that. You have to do this. You have to do that. These verses here... We don't have time to, to, to go into this anymore, but it really, it captures the epitome of legalism because uh, so much of it is always about don't, 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 don't. You're so busy don'ting, you forget to do. Okay, I, 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 can't, I, I can't do that. I'm going to try, oh, I can't do that. I gonna, no, I can't do that. Oh, did I do something I wasn't supposed to do? I mean, this is an exactly a trap of, of, of where the enemy, enemy wants you to live. And fear It's man-made doctrine, doctrine that focuses on self. It's, it ends up focusing on a self-righteousness. Like, 
Like, I, I am living holy enough. Stop it. You're not holy enough. You never will be. It's because of a holy and righteous God that, 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 that he knew this. He, that's why he came to earth and did it for us. And that we might believe and by faith put our trust in him. And when we do, he indwells us. And now it's the power of the Holy Spirit that has made uh, old things pass away and all things become new. And now I, have, now I have a new nature. I have Christ in me, the hope of glory. I, I, I want to do the right things. I'm so busy doing the right things for God. I don't even have time to worry about what I shouldn't be doing. It's taking care of itself because of the Holy Spirit that is abiding in my life. The power of the Holy Spirit. Our foundation for living for Christ was described in that 12th verse that I read. In, in the 6th chapter of Romans, we were buried with him in baptism, in which we were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. This is why he speaks of these false doctrines coming into the church, but I love it. Right in the middle of talking about them, he says, I need to remind you about what this is all about. I need to remind you of who Jesus Christ really is. Will the real Jesus Christ stand up? And he stands up right in the middle of this second chapter of Colossians, proclaiming these truths. And this is why Paul could not help himself. And as a minister of the gospel, began slowly but surely uh, being able to, to relate to what he talks about when he writes in the first uh, uh uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, five, 1 through 5, when he says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So man-made ideologies, persuasive words and philosophies of those of you that have a higher knowledge and, and, have, and have found things that you're not even looking at, those that decide to give God some help and, 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 and point a finger at you and say, make sure that you're not doing this, don't do that, don't do this, and don't do that. All of those, they don't help you live a victorious overcoming life for the Lord. They don't help you against the indulgences of our flesh because they're, they're weak in, in that they're human. You need help with the indulgences of your flesh? Rely on the power of the Holy Spirit of God that is dwelling in you as a child of God. He, he, he will, he will meet you at your point of need. He will help you overcome these things that are distracting you or these obstructions that you can't get over. He will break through these barriers that are seemingly holding you back. And, and let, let, let's stand this morning. And as the worship team leads us in a, in, in a song just for a, a couple of minutes, I want you to think about responding to what the Word of God is saying, what the presence of God has been revealing to you and, 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 and wanting to do in your life. Listen, if, 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 if you're going to sit there stiff-necked and not submit and surrender and submit to God, I'm not sure how much God can help you. I mean, think of this. The God of the universe... He's not going to violate your will. He's a gentleman. He's a good God. He's a kind God. He's a merciful God. He's a gentle God. Much more gentle to, than me. Much, much more gentle than me. But this just is such a reality and such a life changer. I want us to just consider what His presence has already been doing in your life here today in this building. With this word that, that, that Paul wrote in the second chapter of Colossians and the significance of who Christ is. Because we're never going to keep up with all of the man-made ideologies and philosophies. We're never going to keep up with the, with the demands of regulations and rules and restrictions that religion and, and tradition put on our lives. We're not going to keep up. But we can keep up by knowing who Jesus is. Acknowledging him for who he is. Submitting and surrendering our lives I just picture uh, uh, that, that the Holy Spirit, for those of you that were surrendering and submitting, that God was cleaning house. And I prayed to myself, God, clean my house. Go into every closet, go into every crack and every crevice, 
Let the power of your Holy Spirit wash over me. Purge me from all iniquity and transgression. God, that I might walk holy and pure and right before you. And, and you know, I believe that he answers that prayer because it's his desire and his will for my life. And he will do it for you. He will do it for you. So let's sing, let's respond to the Lord before we close in prayer.